What's up folks and welcome back to another day in Eternum. I had this one recorded and ready to go because I knew once we got into beta, it would be nice to make sure we had a nice big recap. That way you don't have to go anywhere else. You can just stay right here and soak it all in. And so today we're going to be diving right into how you can prepare for New World. All of this information is things we've covered specifically in my previous individual videos. But if you don't feel like scouring through all that information, I'm going to go ahead and give you a baseline description of what to expect all in this one place. For a more in-depth look on each topic, I will list out which videos you'll want to check out for each. And before we begin, look alive because we're only one month away from beta before we finally get our chance to try this game out for real, hopefully. Let's cross our fingers, hope for the best, and remember to stay vigilant in the face of issues or good moments to come. Let's go ahead and start with the company that's developing the title. The New World MMO, as you probably have already guessed, is being developed by Amazon Game Studios. Located in Irvine, California, and during our time learning about the game, we were introduced to some of the team members that were working for it. We've seen people such as Scott Lane, the studio director, along with Michael Willette, Dan Henneber, David Verfaelli, and so many more. In 2016, they announced three upcoming titles at TwitchCon, which included Breakaway, Crucible, and of course, Amazon's very own New World. Since those years, we did get our hands on a previous alpha testing phase, which did feature the early iteration of the New World MMO. This version was heavily focused on open world PvP and was the one that I compared a lot to something like a modern day Darkfall. In this one, you started the game just like anyone else as a regular adventurer on the beach and you had the freedom to explore and take on the sandbox how you felt necessary. This also promoted a lot of open world PvP and in some cases, ganking and griefing. These are normal instances to see from games in the sandbox genre, but after the alpha ended, after much consideration and feedback, Amazon Game Studios decided to change the direction of the game and under studio director Scott Lane, developed the game in a way where it could cater to both sides of the player base, with the heavier influence on the player versus environment content, like we'll discuss later. This was done because they felt as if they didn't want players to have their experiences cut short or lose all of their recent progress in one fell swoop. And so, the new version of the New World was born, which leads us to the story. The story of New World is that we as explorers are coming to an island known as Eternum. Why we're being sent here, we don't know. But we do know that this is an island filled with a magical resource known as Azoth. This resource has the ability to shape and influence the world around it. We've seen it create things of great beauty and also be the cause of corruption. This takes place in an alternate version of the 17th century, and during the Game Awards trailer that we saw last December, we did get a showcase of what appears to be Romans visiting the island, which could mean we might see even more past civilizations in the future. Now on the island itself, it is actually comprised of its own complex ecosystem. First up, you have the Angry Earth. This group of creatures represents the full embodiment of nature on the island. It takes many forms, including what are known as the guardians of the island, like you would see for this deer and wolf. Along with that, this faction also consists of wood-like creatures known as the Dryads, and we get a couple shots of them during the previous developer diaries and screenshots. After that, we have the Lost, who act as the undead of this world. Amazon Game Studios describes them as people that are stuck in a half-death state or have died in some horrific way, or sailors that have crash-landed on the island. From what I've learned so far about them, I believe they are what happens to us when we as explorers die, but don't become ancients or corrupted of the island. And speaking of those factions, Let's talk about the Ancients first. Just like the name suggests, this was known as the ancient civilization of Eternum that was known to harness the power of Azoth. Something happened to the Ancients that caused them to disappear, but we will still see remnants of their civilization scattered throughout the island. We also have what are known as Guardians of the Ancients that still defend their secrets and may have taken on their long lost knowledge and equipment. And then finally, we have the Corrupted. The corruption is a result of what happens when us as the players develop a darkness within our hearts. Not a lot's known about what originally created them, but we do know that when people come into contact with anything that seems darkness infused, we turn into these creatures as well. Over the course of time in Eternum, we'll be spending a lot of time fighting this group of enemies since they will end up being one of the major dangers we'll come across. For the game system specifications, I'll go ahead and place a picture up on the screen so you can see. It's going to be important to remember that this game has a lot of detail graphically and effects 
resource-wise, so it might end up being slightly or much more resource-intensive than other titles in the genre. If I had to point out one thing that might be most important to pull from these specs, it would be the RAM. Recommended take 16 gigs, so if you don't trust your current RAM setup or only have 8 inside your tower, now might be a perfect time to consider an upgrade to avoid any issues on launch. Now for the game's server location, we don't know for sure if they'll end up adding more upon beta and launch, but from previous interviews, they've said that we'll only be getting US servers and EU servers on launch, with approximately 1,000 to 2,000 plus players per server. We will also only be able to have one character per server and there is no console version planned currently. Sorry about that guys. For the cash shop, they'll have a cosmetic only planned along with housing decorations and specific cosmetics for Twitch Prime. We will also have a die system available from what they've said so players should be able to make their characters unique to others. Hopefully that system stays out of the cash shop as much as possible and more on the base game for us to make use of. Also so far, they've made no mention of a player to player trade system so we might not have that before launch. On the topic of combat, we've seen that New World features a third person action combat with inspirations from action RPGs such as Dark Souls. It features a custom reticle for ranged combat between the bows, muskets, and pistol weapons. With this fighting system, Amazon Game Studios describes it as real time action combat, positioning, tactics, and reaction time will determine the outcome of the battle far more than just gear, and this should apply for both both PvP and PvE combat. For weapons we have currently, we have seen about 15 total so far, and 13 of which we have seen or possibly have seen in the game's current footage. The weapons are as follows. One-handed sword and shield, the throwing axe which can be used as a melee weapon, bow and arrow, muskets, the pistol, two-handed spears, one-handed rapiers, great axes, great hammers, Alberts is shown in the screenshot, what appears to be a great sword from this fire magic clip, and for magic we have confirmed fire magic and healing. For the last two weapons we only have concept art for them currently. One of them is the one handed maces that may pop up again in the game's future, and the other is the gauntlets which used to be the healing weapon of the new world previous alpha. It's unknown so far if they will be making a return, but when they do we can only hope that they might be expanded on for offensive magic as well. A while back in a video I talked about how great it would be to see different types of magic in the game's future besides those we know of now. They've said in previous interviews that they would always work on the combat and add more weapons, so hopefully we'll see some more variety in the future for all you casters out there. For the armor in game, they haven't really dived into it a whole lot, but during the third developer diary, Scott Lane explained that depending on our playstyle, we would be able to choose what type of armor we wore. So for frontline fighters we could elect to go for something more heavy based, and for a backline caster we might decide to choose something more light. So far we've seen different variations of what appears to be light, medium, and heavy armor, but for this topic we'll probably get more information and additions to it in the future. Also one thing to note about gear is apparently in New World when we create our characters we will be able to choose our own starting equipment. This was touched on in the French based article we saw from the closed press event, and it was also said that we could expect to see at least 4 different choices of them. Now for the next part, we'll be diving into the crafting and character progression. Our characters will be making use of these 5 attributes. Strength, which affects our melee damage. Dexterity for our ranged weapons and certain melee based ones. Intelligence for pumping up our magical weapons alongside any magical perks our weapons have. Focus for increasing our mana regeneration and cooldown reduction. And finally constitution, which increases our health pool. Each character starts with 5 in each attribute by default, and if you're looking to increase this, you will gain at least 1 attribute point per level and these stats seem to saw cap at 60. If you want to get any higher, you will need to make use of jewelry and gem slots. Each weapon we use will have their own skill trees with at least 2 different specializations for each one. These will include passives, usable skills, and upgrades for those skills. We gain experience in these skill trees by engaging in combat with the specified weapon. Each time we level up in the skill tree, we get one point. And if you ever want to respecialize your skills, you can do so by spending the resource called Azoth. So far we know that one way to get Azoth is through corrupted invasions, but in a recent tweet that showcased the crafting system, we also saw a drop from one of the ancients as well. And not only is it used to respect our skill trees, or gold to respect our attributes, but Azoth is also used for crafting. For the crafting system, this was shown to us in a previous dev blog. We have several professions making a return from the previous alpha, including weaponsmithing, armor crafting, jewel crafting, engineering, arcanist, cooking, and furnishing. 
First thing we'll tackle is the jewel crafting due to the conversation we had earlier about gem slots. This craft is used for creating trinkets which was shown to us in the item dev blog, along with shaping gems that give attributes that we can socket into our gear. The trinkets consist of rings, earrings, and necklaces, and these are not only capable of increasing our stats, but they can also have what we know as perks. Perks allow us to get special bonuses tailored to combat and crafting on our gear and jewelry. The quality of equipment we craft is determined partly by the gear score and also by the amount of perks it has, and this applies from the gray grade all the way up to legendary. The crafting goes in tiers. For weapons, for example, iron would be known as tier 2, steel for tier 3, star metal for tier 4, and orichalcum at tier 5. These tiers are also locked behind levels plus the gear score ranges, as you can see here. You won't be able to use the max tier equipment right away. When dealing with a profession like weaponsmithing or armorsmithing, you can gather special resources from the open world to increase your chances of getting specific perks when you craft. You can also dump Azoth into the recipe to increase the perk chance further. For gem slots, if you really want one, you can add more of the primary resource to the recipe to increase the chances of that. For the other professions, cooking would be tied to crafting food that gives us buffs for combat and crafting. As shown in this example, we'll get access to food that increases potential gear score while crafting, or even effectiveness while fighting specific enemies. For our Canis, they work in a similar way, where we can craft things like healing or mana tinctures, which give instant effects, or potions that provide a general magic effect that can last for several minutes. Weapon coatings can be applied to weapons to increase our damage against a specific enemy. So for preparing for the Spriggan inside the arena, for instance, we might be able to stock up on angry earth coatings. And lastly, for furnishing, this one deals with crafting decorations and functional items we can place in our houses. We'll be going over this next, but this is also where we jump into trophies. These are items that also give passive bonuses for combat and crafting. We found out in a recent article that we might even be able to stack these. And when it comes to storage space, we will be able to craft satchels that give us further inventory space, but furnishing is where we can increase our bank space by putting storage items in our house. Last thing is the gathering. So far, we know that we'll have woodcutting, skinning, mining, and gathering. No mention of fishing yet, but it was under development in the last alpha, so we might just see it again in the future. But alright, let's talk about housing. For our houses in New World, they'll be located inside what is known as a settlement. Each settlement has a variety of different houses in terms of their size, features, and cost. The houses follow a system similar to Black Desert Online, where we can buy a house in a specific spot, but that same house with those same features can be bought by other players and decorated differently. It's instance housing so we won't have to deal with things like rushing for land grabs. Now even though it is instanced, we can still visit each other's houses via the housing menu that pops up when we interact with it. We can also see previews of each other's houses via the housing points and party system. If we own a house in a particular spot in a settlement, we will by default see our own house with all of its decoration. But if we don't own a house in that spot, then it will show a preview of the person with the highest housing points, which you earn these points by decorating your house with furniture or earning territory standing. And if you're in a party of players, you will then be able to see and visit their houses via this menu too. In terms of how else a house can be useful to you, with the house you get access to trophies and a recall point that you can fast travel back to. For the trophies, they act as magical items you can place in your house that provide active buffs for your character. And apparently, these buffs can either be combat or crafting related, so it might be a good idea to shoot for getting a house as soon as possible. To own a house, you have to reach level 20 in your current territory standing, and you can do this in several ways including farming mobs, completing faction missions, working on town projects, and crafting items. Also you can own multiple houses as long as you meet the requirements for territory standing. You can get one at level 20, another at level 40, and one more at level 60 as far as we know. Also wanted to include in this section that right now the housing is in its beginner state, but later on they do plan on adding housing interactions like touching objects and sitting down, or even pushing objects and different emote based things like walking or strolling. And with that, let's talk about the factions. We have three total we'll be choosing from on our journey. The first is Covenant, a fanatical order that has charged itself with cleansing the land of heretics. Then we have the Marauders, a ruthless military force bent on establishing a free nation where anyone with the strength to do so can prosper and profit. And finally, the Syndicate, a secret organization of boundless guile and intellect that searches for forbidden knowledge to usher in a new age of enlightenment. We will all be given the opportunity to join one of these three factions upon reaching level 10, and they will end up playing a pretty big part in our time spent in Eternum. 
It's also worth mentioning that during the faction developer blog, they said that in the future the system will be built in a way to make it to where even if a faction falls behind, they will still get bonuses to make them feel more like an underdog instead of the losing side. And if your faction is superior, you will still be given bonuses for that too. Faction imbalance is something we talked about being a possibility during my 7 potential issues of New World video, so we can only hope that these bonuses given to underdog factions will make it possible for comebacks in the end. So now that you know the basics of the faction system, we can start diving into how they play a part in the world of Eternum, and how they'll influence the settlements we'll find around the map. Settlements are pre-built towns that players are able to use, control, fight over, and upgrade while we progress through Eternum. Some of you may have played the previous alpha where we had access to free building to a certain degree. This aspect has been changed to include pre-built forts alongside towns. Settlements are where we'll find our houses, crafting benches we can use and upgrade for different professions, our respawn points if our characters go down nearby, and also a place we can go to take on town projects plus faction missions. To take ownership of a settlement, first we have to form what's known as a company, or or in other games these would be known as guilds. When the company is created, the person who started it becomes what's known as a governor, and from what we've been told from screenshots and developer diaries, we should have the ability to design emblems to mark our companies in a unique way. Once the company is made, it automatically gets tied to whatever faction the company leader is a part of. And to claim a settlement, during the early stages of the game we can travel to the settlement fort and pay a fee to claim it. On the other hand of that, if it's already taken, we'll have to fight for it instead through the method of war which we'll touch on a bit later. As the company governor, we'll be able to set town projects which act as a method of upgrading the settlement's different crafting benches and fort defenses. Along with that, you have what are known as lifestyle buffs. These are long-term bonuses for things like crafting and combat that will only apply to the territory residents themselves. The governor can activate them, but they are solely built and executed through the town projects board. Aside from these different duties, the governor also has access to setting the taxes of the settlement. From what we've seen, there appears to be different taxes for us as the player. This top left icon here seems to be the housing tax, bottom left one appears to be crafting related, bottom right looks like a gathering or refining tax of sorts, and the top right could be an auction house or trading type of tax. Now you might think to yourself that this is a huge amount of power for just one person to handle, and you would be absolutely right. But luckily, the governor has the power to appoint what are known as consuls. People of this rank would act as the officers of the company who are able to directly control and complete things like the governor could, just in case the leader happens to go inactive. There's also an upkeep that needs to be paid for the settlement, or else we'll start to see downgrades for the refining, crafting benches, and fortifications. This can also happen if we don't defend against the corrupted invasions, but the most important thing to note when you conquer a settlement through claiming or warfare, it immediately becomes under the control of the faction the company is a part of. Each faction is able to live under the settlement's roof even if it's claimed by an enemy faction, but if you are a part of the faction that owns it, you won't be able to attack it via warfare unless someone else takes it first. And speaking of warfare, let's talk about how the declaration and faction mission system come into play. So if you come across a settlement that you feel like you might have a chance at taking, here is the current way we will fight for it. First, we have to conduct what are known as faction missions. There's a player vs environment version and a player vs player version of these. The PvP version seems to be the one to generate what's known as influence. Each player that does these missions can generate a certain amount of influence and once the faction itself has enough, it goes to a state of being undermined and a company inside that faction will be able to declare against the settlement. You also receive other rewards besides influence, like golden experience, similar to the town projects, but we'll focus on just the influence for now. The companies also need to spend a good chunk of gold for the declaration, but once they do, one of the companies becomes selected as the vanguard of the attacking forces. And yes, that means companies of small size and large have an equal chance of becoming the vanguard, which is a feature I've spoken on in the past as potentially being an issue in the future, but we'll go ahead and slide past that topic for now. So once a vanguard is chosen, they'll be able to choose the attacking force from the players who sign up to fight. These players can come from the faction that is declaring or the third faction that isn't directly involved in the battle. That means that if it's a fight between the Marauders and Syndicate, Covenant can join in, or vice versa where Syndicate is against Covenant and Marauders can join the fray on either side. The defending faction will also be able to choose players from the people that signed up, and this is a different system from how the invasion feature sign up will work where it will instead be randomized to a degree. We'll talk more about that one later, but first, let's discuss what happens during the war. Once the war phase begins, we'll have an hour to duke it out inside the enclosed area. The objective of the attacking side is to push a total of three capture points. To start the takeover process, we have to stand on them until the bar completely fills and we have full control of the area. 
After that, we can use that specific rally point as a respawn or access to the armory building, which allows us to buy various supplies and siege engines. After we have all three points, we can then begin the process of attacking the fortress gates. We won't be able to do this until all three points go down. At this point, we'll have to use any means necessary to take down that fortress. Territory War features different types of siege engines we can buy, like I mentioned before. And for a quick summary, we have engines like the cannon platform that specialize against structures and slow moving targets, fire launcher platform that is effective against infantry, repeater platform that serves a similar purpose, and even more on the defender side. Once we breach the gate, we will then be able to charge into the final capture point as shown in the footage. During this time we will have to watch out because the defending side will also have access to more than just siege engines. They'll also be able to purchase items like inferno mines that can do a heap of damage if we get caught in them, fire cauldrons placed above the gates that they can rain down on us from, and even a mighty horn that can buff their defenses for a short amount of time. And if they're able to hold us off for the full duration of the siege, they will then keep the territory. And now that you know the basics of how the new world will function, let's talk about what zones we've discovered so far. Some of the zones from the previous alpha have made a comeback and along with that, we have some newer additions that we've seen so far. The first one we come across is known as North Windsward or Just Windsward. It shows up in multiple screenshots and was also an area we explored during the last alpha. Looks like this is the first one that will be making its return. Next up is Monarch's Bluff, which was shown off during the Faction blog earlier this year, along with Brightwoods showing up to showcase the territory planning menu and town projects. It appears that both of these are making a return, except that Monarch's Bay is renamed to Bluffs instead. After that we have the area of Morningdale, showcased during the third developer diary for New World and is already shaping up to be one of my favorites just based off its rainy weather we see shown in multiple clips. Any region with dynamic weather automatically becomes my favorite by default. This one along with Cutlass Keys appears to be two new areas that I don't personally recognize from the last alpha, with Cutlass being showcased during the GameStar extended alpha footage back in February. These two seem to be new additions to the rest. And also just going off the old alpha map, we had Weaver's Fen, which was an area the media used very often to showcase those territory battles we saw in the old alpha footage, and both First Light plus Consolation. We haven't seen either one yet in public footage so far, but there could be more than one that we have yet to learn the name of. And another is the snowy based region we saw during the third developer diary. So let's hope it's a new area with more room instead of an older one. Now that we've got that out of the way, it's time to finish talking about the available content we know of so far for New World. Let's start with the player versus environment for this one. So we have faction missions, player versus environment and PVP quests for various rewards and influence, town projects which can be used for upgrading crafting and refining benches plus fort defenses. Questing system which they've gone over in previous different articles. Not sure how many quests there are total but media have described it as being in a very basic state at the time of their first impressions. And of course, whatever grinding areas they decided to give us. PVE arenas which we'll touch on in just a second here, corrupted breaches, field bosses but no instance dungeons or raids to speak of, and of course, the invasions. So before we move on to the PVP, first let's talk about what we haven't touched on yet. Starting with the arenas. The arenas of New World are essentially instance content where we'll have to farm mobs in a specific area, and while doing so, we'll have a chance to obtain what's known as a Spriggan Key. Once we have it, we get specific coordinates to go to with our party of 5 players total, and then we'll be able to teleport inside it. Right now the arenas consist of a single boss fight, and the only one that's been revealed to us so far is the Spriggan, an elemental creature that hails from the faction of Angry Earth. Without going too much into its detail, the arena basically functions very similar to a primal fight in Final Fantasy XIV, or any other single boss fight mechanic you may have seen in other games. Doing these can yield great rewards, including some of the best gear we'll see in game which includes legendaries. After that we have the Corrupted Breaches. Think of these ones like dynamic events such as Dolmens from Elder Scrolls Online or Rifts in Guild Wars 2 for instance. These are open world points of interest around the map that spawn at random and come in different types. We learned of these few during the developer blog for it. The Corrupted Monoliths, Corrupted portals, infested groves, and festering hives. The enemies we face from these will be primarily corrupted base, and we will need what's known as an Azoth staff to close them after we beat the monsters. It's said that to get this staff, we'll be able to utilize crafting, but it also states that we will get access to consumables that will protect us further from corruption. And just like the arenas, this will also be a piece of content that we can do that gives resources rarely found anywhere else in the game 
game world. These also tie heavily into what I consider my favorite piece of content from the game, and that's the invasions. This is the mechanic where the corrupted in the north start to gather strength to attack the settlement we've worked so hard to build up. The invasion cycle happens every four days, and leading up to it, the corrupted breaches we talked about start to become much more frequent. The process of the invasions are similar to that of the territory war, except we as the players are on the defending side and the attackers are the corrupted. During the fight itself, we'll have to defend against waves of them and they will be bringing different types. This will include up to boss monsters themselves even, so we'll have to make sure to bring our A game. We get access to the armory to purchase supplies and weapons just like any other modes, so that should make things a little bit easier to deal with. The part where it gets tricky and possibly problematic for the future is the company that owns the settlement can reserve up to 10 players from their company for the invasion. The remaining 40 players are chosen at random from those signed up hoping they decide to increase that to 25 or 30 at some point, because if you lose an invasion, your settlement will get downgraded as a result. And losing levels on crafting benches is no bueno if you have people on your side who aren't ready for the fight ahead. And on the other side of that, if you survive the invasion without losing the fortress, the battle is won and you will instead receive rewards. So be sure to give it all you've got when you're in there. And now for the easy part. Let's break down the PvP content we'll have available in New World. So as most of you know, previously in the old New World Alpha, the system had an open world player versus player design. You were free to attack other players, but if you did, you would end up being flagged as a criminal, which would result in much greater penalties if you died, as opposed to just dying as a non-criminal player. That has since been changed in New World to feature an opt-in PvP system. After players choose their faction at level 10, they will immediately be able to opt-in from that point onward. Amazon Game Studios has said that we should also get rewards for being flagged as PvP players to incentivize fighting between the factions, and we can only flag or unflag from the safe zone settlements throughout the world. It's also important to note that PvP-based faction missions that generate influence will also flag you by default, and if your character dies while you have one accepted, you will lose your progress for that mission as a result. Past that, we don't know if opt-in PvP will have any extra benefits or be enough to satisfy player versus player content outside the territory wars, but there's already been suggestions on how they could build this new version of the game while still staying within their vision of a free will PvP system. Some of these suggestions will include things we've talked about before, such as open world points of interest or fortresses on the map we could fight over at any time of the day, or even an honor system, PvP events or repeatable quests tied to the flagging system, battlegrounds, PvP based arenas, etc. But all in all, we'll have to see what they decide to do when it comes to this section of the game. The next two mechanics we have for PvP are the faction missions and the territory wars, which we luckily don't have to recap on since we talked about how they would work and what purpose they serve for the game itself. But the last thing I wanted to mention was a dueling system. This is a highly requested feature from the previous alpha and currently from the players interested in the game. They've said publicly in previous interviews that we might not have the dueling system on launch, but it is something they're currently working on. Hopefully something like that pops up in the future so we can promote practice matches and training within our own faction. Now the final thing we're going to touch on is the extra details mentioned in the media event and interviews that Amazon Game Studios hosted earlier this year. First, we have the map size being docked in at a plan 40 kilometers squared, which is actually slightly bigger than the size of Skyrim. They also talked about expansions being planned for the future, alongside naval combat slash exploration being a possibility if players wanted it. Past civilizations have been teased as a part of the island of Eternum's past and possibly future, both in the Game Awards trailer with the Roman soldiers, and also in recent posted pictures from their Twitter. They also mentioned a while back during an interview with main-mmo.de that since they will also focus a bit on Twitch integration for the game, that they do have multiple planned features to showcase streamers including a streamer spotlight and streamer army mechanic. They haven't mentioned these at all since then, so I'm not sure what the current details on these are, but be sure to keep an eye out for them nonetheless. And lastly, they have actually mentioned their content roadmap. Like we talked about before, they've stated that they will always work on improving the combat and adding more weapons into the game. Since New World features a classless based system, the skill trees and attributes we invest in will be closely tied to the weapons we use, and we are capable of maxing out all of them along with the crafting professions if we wanted to. We'll only get one character per server and we cannot switch factions unless we delete it and remake it. They have said that they already have a planned out roadmap for 12 months, so hopefully once the game launches, it'll have a steady update schedule already in place for new features and bug fixes. 
On top of that, they've also stated in a recent interview with Respawn First that they do plan to support New World for up to 10 years and possibly beyond. Of course, we know that they will be developing their Lord of the Rings Online title at the same time, but it seems like they are hiring for a lot more positions for that game by itself. So there's a good chance if New World does well that they will be able to support both titles for that designated amount of time. But with that folks, that is everything you need to know about New World before its beta and launch. I hope I got everything possibly in here for you and if there's anything I missed, please be sure to leave it in the comments below, along with your thoughts about how you feel about the game in its current state. Thank you all very much for watching and as always, have a wonderful night or day. Farewell.